Well, friends, what about life after Christmas? It's, uh, for some of us, maybe a lot of us, it's been a crazy kind of hectic month, right? And as much as every Sunday we said, hey, let's slow down and be ready for God's presence, it gets crazy, doesn't it? It gets crazy and it's busy. And, of course, there's always a mix of emotions with family around or not around and all that goes along with all of that. But, you know, the truth is we always remember what is Christmas really about? It's about Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus coming to this earth, God coming to be with us, God's uh, promises fulfilled that God would come and do something about the sin and the darkness in the world. And, and so it's our hope that we don't lose sight of that in the midst of it all. But then the question is, but now what? Uh, now that we proclaim that Jesus has come, how does that change things? How does that affect our lives? How does that impact how we live and what comes next? And so we kind of have a, a key question as we move into things this morning, and that is, what does the birth of Jesus mean for you in the new year to come? What does the birth of Jesus mean for you in the new year to come? Now here at New Heights, we, we like to expand our Christmas celebrations and, and try to take our time and enjoy them a couple weeks longer, and so our children's Christmas program is here in a few weeks, and we've done that for a couple of reasons. One of those is because de- December tends to be such a crazy, hectic time, and families celebrate Christmas usually in multiple places at multiple times. We found that it was really hard to get all of our children together on a Sunday in December. And so we wait till January, and everybody's Christmas celebrations are done, and then we can get everyone together to celebrate. But it allows us to spread this out a couple more weeks, and I hope it also maybe allows us to maybe separate out a little bit the the holiday fever that goes on in our culture from what this is really all about, the coming of our Savior. And so we get to zero in on that in these weeks ahead. But, you know, the other thing that happens uh, both in the Scripture and in, our chur- in the church year is that we have very little in the Bible about Jesus' childhood, right? And so we celebrate Christmas morning, or Jesus is coming, And then before we know it, Jesus is an adult and ministry is happening and crucifixion comes and it's like, what, where did all that go, right? What happened? And so this life after Christmas, a little bit today is to pause for a moment and we're going to be with Jesus and his parents uh, just eight days after he's born. Uh, They take him to the temple uh, to be dedicated, and so we get a little insight into the, that very beginning of Jesus' life. And it's sort of like an opportunity for us to hit the pause button on jumping forward too quick and to make sure that we take some time to really think about what all of this is about and what it means. And so today we're going to be in that story of Jesus' first week on this earth. And then again, connecting that to our everyday life. What does that mean for us in this new year to come? What does it mean for us that Jesus has come? So let's start here in Luke chapter 2, we're at verse 21, and it begins with eight days later. Eight days later from what? Well, from Jesus' birth. So, eight days later when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name given him by the angel even before he was conceived. And then it was time for their purification offering, as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now pause there for a moment. Luke uh, is, is taking his time to very carefully let us know some details that for us maybe might be somewhat meaningless or not important, but certainly very important for Luke's immediate audience, which is those first century Christians, often Jewish folks. And, and notice that he's very careful to say the exact number of days, eight days, that Jesus was circumcised, and then to say that also because it was required, they went to the temple in Jerusalem, and they did these particular things, they made their offering. All of that's in there so that Jesus's, uh, so that the first century audience would know that Jesus is legit, okay? Which is another way of saying they were following the rules they were supposed to follow. And for Jewish customs and Jewish religious beliefs, it was very important that they followed what was written in the book of Leviticus. Now, that pertained to the Jewish folks and their culture, and that's what they're following through on. But understand that Luke is giving us these details because he's speaking to a specific audience that he wants them to know that 
yes, they did the things they were supposed to do all the right way. Now, the other way I like to think of this, though, is interesting. Uh, here's Mary and Joseph, brand new parents with their first baby, and parents who have had their first baby, you kind of know how that goes. You want to make sure you do everything right, right? They're, we got to do it all the right way, and we're very careful and make sure that we, you know, we cover all the details and we protect. And when Ann and I had Kaya, we, we didn't take her to church for like three or four weeks because the doctor said you should stay out of public places. And we thought, well, we don't want our baby to get sick. And, of course, by the time Sonia was around, it was like, how soon can we get here? You know, right, and those things change as it goes along as, as you have more children that you're, it's a little more easygoing. But you have this picture of Mary and Joseph, um, this simple couple that come from a simple background, but they've been told these incredible things about this baby. And they're doing what a, what a good Jewish couple is supposed to do, and so they're following the rules, and they bring Jesus to the temple and now something really incredible is going to happen. And we're going to meet a man named Simeon. Uh, I want you to listen to the, to the story about Simeon and what Simeon says about Jesus. So, at that time, this is as they come to the temple. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace. As you have promised, I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been, seen as a, he has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. There's a lot of hopefulness and good things in this prophecy, but also a lot of difficult news in here as well, isn't it? But what an, what an interesting story, first of all, about, about Simeon. So we don't know a lot of details about Simeon, but it would seem likely that he, he probably worked in the temple. He, maybe was, he was probably one of the priests, but it wasn't his turn to be at work that day. But what we hear about Simeon is that he was filled with the Spirit. And he was somebody who was practiced at listening for God's leading. And he had been told previously by God, he had heard God say to him, Simeon, you're going to see the Messiah. Before you die, you will see the Messiah. And so Simeon had spent his life looking forward to Jesus' coming, to the Messiah's coming. He had been waiting and watching for God to come and do something. And on this particular day, he had gotten that nudging from the Spirit saying, you need to go to the temple today. Right? And, and many of us, we're, we're working on that in our lives. How do we pay attention to the nudgings of the Spirit and listen when God is prompting us to do something? And Simeon hears God's prompting. You need to go to the temple today. And so Simeon comes in on his day, and here he is in the temple. And as Mary and Joseph, this very ordinary, simple couple, walk in with this seemingly very ordinary child, the light bulb goes off in Simeon's brain and he hears the Spirit say, this is the one. The Messiah has come. And so you can imagine Simeon, this old man, this prophet, this priest, getting late in his years, dreaming of the Messiah coming, and suddenly he hears God saying, this is the one. And he scoops up baby Jesus and he begins to prophesy about who this child is and what he will do with his life and how God will work through him. And and as I said, some of that is this exciting hopefulness and some of this prophecy and news is filled with difficulty and heartache. And you can probably imagine Mary and Joseph just taking this in and trying to make sense of it. And here, you know, they'd been given these, they'd heard from angels and been given prophecies and the shepherds came on the night of Jesus' birth. And here again, they show up and out of nowhere, someone they've never met before says, this is the one, this is the Messiah. This is the one who God has promised 
and he's come to save Israel. He is the light to reveal God to the nations. Simeon's uh, prophecy and announcement is a prophecy and announcement about God's kingdom coming. And it's a sign of hopefulness for God's people. And it's a sign of new life to come. This connects for me in all sorts of important ways with us in our lives. So first of all, this is the time of year where the new year begins, isn't it? And for us, new year signifies all sorts of things. But a lot of that is about opportunity. A new year means there are new opportunities in front of us. We look at a new year as a chance to start over again, to try something new, to change something we've been, we've been meaning or wanting to change in us or about us. The new year signifies opportunities to venture out in new ways or to reorient our lives and how we spend our time and our energy and our resources. A new year means hope, right? A new year means hope. And in many ways, this is the same kind of thing that Simeon is proclaiming with Jesus, that God coming to this earth means there is an opportunity for you and I to have new life. There's opportunity for you and I to start all over again. There's opportunity for you and I to make some changes, to do some things differently. There's opportunity for life to be discovered in a new way. And just as Simeon says about Jesus, he is a light to reveal God to the nations. We are reminded that we have been called to be the light, to reveal God to others, to be God's presence in this world. But there's another important connection here. Uh, Jesus is brought to the temple on this day to be dedicated. And in the Lutheran church, generally speaking, we practice infant baptism. Now, we baptize people of all ages, but most often we baptize infants. And different churches have different practices around baptism, and there's positives and minuses to all approaches. But there's, there's a kind of a core reason why we focus generally on baptizing babies, and that is because we want to emphasize what God is doing. We want to emphasize God's actions. A baby has no choice in being baptized. Somebody else is making that choice for them. But what we're lifting up in baptism is God's choice. God choosing us as God's children. We sang this morning, you're a good, good father. That's who you are. And I am loved by you. That's who I am. That's what we're proclaiming in baptism, that this baby who has no choice in the matter is claimed by God, loved by God, saved by God, forgiven by God. And guess what else? Sent on a mission by God. Created with a purpose and a plan, a mission to live out their life. And just as Simeon proclaims these things about Jesus, this is God's Messiah who will be a light to the nations well, God makes these same claims about us. We are God's beloved children. And you and I are sent on a mission to be the light of the world, to reveal God to others, to be God's presence in very powerful and important ways. And so uh, I have some things I want you to think about this morning, some things I want you to wrestle with, and we're actually going to take a little bit of time to talk with one another today. But this key question that I'm asking today is, what does the birth of Jesus mean for you in the new year to come? What does the birth of Jesus mean? We're not going to let Christmas just come and go and forget about this incredible thing that's happened, that God has come to this earth, and that changes everything. It means new life, new opportunity, new possibilities for us. So what does the birth of Jesus mean for you in the new year to come? And what I want to ask you to do here for about 30 seconds is just think about that, pray about that, and then in a moment we're going to talk with one or two people around us. So take some time to talk with God. What does this birth of Jesus mean for you in the new year to come? And so, friends, as you look to this new year, a new year with all sorts of possibilities, you know, we don't know exactly what it is that God has in store for us, but we know that God is with us no matter what. But God gives us the promise of new life 
And God says, I will work through you. I will be with you always. So I'd like to ask you to find one or two people around you and just in quiet conversation, what, do you have any sense about what God might be calling you to in this new year? Or any sense of how uh, Jesus' birth will impact you in the year to come? Just have some, we're going to take two or three minutes for quiet conversation. So what does Jesus, what does the birth of Jesus mean for you in the new year to come? Go ahead and talk about that with some folks around you. Thirty second warning. Thirty second warning.
Well, folks, if I could bring your attention back up here. Folks, this is holy conversation. This is what we do as the people of God. As far as I know, there's not many theological degrees out here. And yet, you are perfectly capable of talking about God's work in your life. And that's what we do as God's people. And we don't know what this next year is going to bring. We don't know what it's going to look like. But we do know that God is always with us no matter what, that God has us. And we know that through the highs and the lows that God will walk with us. We know those things to be true. We also know that in our baptism, God has claimed us as God's children. God has said, you are mine. I love you. I forgive you. I've saved you. I'm with you always. We also know this. Um, Simeon says over Jesus, he is a light to reveal God to the nations. And when we baptize children in this place, we say the scripture verse from Matthew 5. It's the basis to our whole shine appeal and the things that we talk about here. We say, uh, the, the light of, may the light of Christ shine in you. Um, that, you, that others may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. The idea is that you and I, as we live out our faith, we shine Christ's light so that God is made known. We make God known in the world as we live out our faith. And so life after Christmas, what does it look like? Well, it looks like going out in the world and listening to God and being that light that we're called to be because God has come and he's with us always. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you are with us and that no matter what this year brings, that your spirit will lead us and guide us, that your spirit will renew us, that your spirit will give us new life. Give us, give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear. Give us a heart that is open to you and your leading. Help us to be like Simeon, aware of your leading in our lives. And help us to fulfill the call that you've given to each of us to be your light in this world. May we bring you glory in all that we do. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things.